now for the shop report with Mr. Jones, did Mr. Jones cut the, the mic? Hello, hello, hello. My bad, my bad. Sorry about that, fellas. Uh, Unfortunately, my mic was off. Silly me, silly me. What up, sports fans? Welcome to the Shop Report. I'm Barbershop Jay. I'll be your host for the day. Here's what's happening. The number to call if you're up and around, you're out and about, you want to give us a shout, is area code 267-687-0026. Once again, the number to call is area code 267-687-0026. Excuse me, And as always... We'd like to remind you the shop report is now being powered by none other than the fine folks at Rocket Digital Media. It's the one-stop shop for all your digital marketing needs. You can look them up on Facebook at RDM Detroit. Once again, that's at RDM Detroit. Or you can go to their website, rocketdigital.net. That's R-O-C-K-I-T digital.net. And you tell them BSJ sent you. Joining us on the P-Program today is none other than my cat from the NYC, a.k.a. Rucker Park. Brother Rich, what's happening? I'm good, sir. How are you? Can't wait to talk about you and your cowboys, sir. Uh, We won't be discussing you and your cowboys or the cowgirls or whatever they are on the show. I told you, first and foremost, and I see I'm going to have to continue to tell you, and your your partner in crime here all of a sudden, I'm a Miami Hurricane football fan strictly, only. Get that? Even when they take when even when they take a L, I'm the first one front and center. And on the other side of the ledger, we got my man from up north, Joey James, aka Double J. Tell the people what you say. Well, it's always a pleasure to be on with uh, you know Will Smith and uh, Carlton Banks, and uh, I hope Cousin Carlton does make an appearance here this evening. Um, nobody circles the wagons like the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> you know what? Uh, don't quit your day job. Number one. Number two. I'm we, sure they got a. We comment. told y'all it's on. We told y'all it's on. And well, you better show up. Well, best go- first show up with that bill thing. We got juice for him. Yeah, y'all better show up. Yeah, we, we applaud you for showing up for having a show. We certainly expected you to cancel. We really did. We really expected you to cancel. I don't we didn't know. Think y'all wanted. Well, if if I do cancel, it won't be because I'm scared. <laughs> of y'all, of the vaudevillians, <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> anyway, this first one, and I'm and I'm sure Gully, if he's out, if Gully, if you're out there listening, would you please call in so we can get these two to business? Uh, but until then, uh, the first <laughs> this first one comes to us from the National Football League, and it is, it is of course, uh, our three games to watch. And the first game, of course, in coming up in Week Seven is the Steelers at the Titans. Now. Before we even go into what happened with the Steelers and the Browns, that's, that's, we're saving that for the latter portion of the show, okay? Can we please get through these three games to watch and none of the shenanigans from uh, Ren and Stimpy? Thank you very much, Ed, Ed, and Eddie. <laughs> yeah. The Steelers at the Titans. What's interesting to me about the Steelers, they are 27th in total offense, 28th in passing, to be specific. 5-0 and oh is their record, though. And, of course, we all witnessed what happened with them and the Browns and the complexion of that game with Double J. How are the Steelers darn near at the bottom in two critical offensive categories and yet 5-0? and oh? Please explain, if you can. Oh, absolutely. Two, two significant reasons. One that plays right into the hands of the other. 
is that old notion that defense wins championships. And as negative as they are from the offensive statistical side, uh, they are the opposite when it comes to the defensive side of the ball. And because of that, they have never really had to play from behind where the deficiencies on the offense would actually get exposed. They now additionally, but just like every other team in this league at this stage of the game, they're dealing with a plethora of injuries across the board. And there is other than Pittsburgh, you might argue that green Bay might be the only other team that the, the concept of the next man up seems to always work out. Uh, where they're almost like a factory of consistency, where somebody like a, a promising young man like Deontay Johnson goes down, uh, is made of glass, and then Chase Clay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Did you just say this guy's made of glass and he plays professional football? Did you really just say that? Unbelievable. Continue. And yet, thrown right into the position previous week, you know, so first week scores four touchdowns uh, and again has a remarkable follow-up or, uh, you know, second appearance as well going into last week. And again, when, when you have that type of, of depth, so to speak, um, it, you know, it, it really makes everything that much easier for the the team this is this is really a league that as much as brother rich and i you know preach about coaching it comes down to consistency that consistency can be found in three places the quarterback position the head coach and your general manager oh you think so starts at the top (laughs) imagine that uh you i do want to point out though the Steelers defensively despite the offense being at or near the bottom Defensively, the Steelers are currently first in total defense. <laughs> so there you have it. And you know what? I just want to mention right quick. I saw them in one of the um, post-NFL shows. They was doing some breakdown, film breakdown. You know, that's that's my thing. I I, I get popcorn, pen, and pad when I am get, get a chance to do some film study. But they were showing how the Steelers are disguising defensive coverages pre-snap and then in the middle of it post-snap I think they stole a page out of the Patriots book we go back a few weeks here I believe now when the Patriots were playing the Chiefs and they showed the same thing where uh, pre-snap there you had two deep safeties not I say too deep but not so 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 deep they were still in the picture if you're watching it on TV you got the two safeties and then once the ball was snapped As the defenders for the Patriots, the linebackers out to the DBs and safeties, as they were backpedaling, they went from a too deep look to a zone look to a man. I had never seen that before, if I'm even explaining that right. And the Steelers had that same look defensively the other day, which is scary to think in addition to they set the edge like no other defense through six weeks or however many weeks so far this season. That is very scary for them for them to be able to do that. They already were notorious, historically, a good defense. They seem to just reload when it comes to defense. But, um, yeah, the way they did it the other day, my goodness, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> it really is. And, and kudos to Mike Tomlin, too, for keeping it all together. But, yeah, uh, the Steelers D is ranked number one in the league. Brother Rich, the Steelers, again, 27th in total offense, 28th in passing. What does that tell you in terms of? I think you, I think you and Double J answered it. I think you all said it. You all, you both used the word reloaded. It's a team that reloads. This is a team that they fire on all cylinders. This is a team that keeps its history. It's intact. And I would use the word for my uh, portion of it to say, this is a brand we're dealing with. This is a brand. This is something when you see it worn on people's chest. And it's interesting that in a city like Los Angeles, in a city like New York, in a city like Chicago, in a city like Detroit, you can find Pittsburgh Steelers fans. 
in a city, in a like, city like Cleveland, Cleveland too. <laughs> such a heated right. Yeah, absolutely. We know that you can find you can find Pittsburgh. You can find them, in fact, all over the world because this is the brand. This is like the Lakers and the Celtics. This is the perpetual brand that has continued with the Pittsburgh Steelers in particular. In their, they are like a family because they are such a fa- they are a family organization. Their brand has maintained a niche that has lasted like uh, Rolex or Mercedes or one of those kinds of things, and they continue to improve on that brand. And Mike Tomlin, and you gave him some kudos a minute ago, he continues to bear that the legacy of a Pittsburgh Steelers coach is what it is. This is a team that continues to rapidly reload. They're never going to be away from the, the top long, and they continue to do what they do. So we're not surprised that their defense, they're holding tight on their defense, and their defense is answering some problems that perhaps their offense can't solve on that, that end. Oh, yeah. Well, their offense will – whatever the defense is, their offense will definitely catch up. <laughs> That's for sure. Because that doggone Claypool, it's another, he, he's another star in the making. How they do it, I have no idea. They just have an he, eye. He must have went to – hey, Double J, he must have went to Miami. No, he, he no, no, Claypool went, he to, he went to Notre Dame. Yeah, get it right. Your trolling is terrible right now. He must be from – he must be from Miami. No, he's not from Miami. He went to Notre Dame. And wherever he's from, it ain't from Miami. It ain't Coral Gables. <laughs> I got a direct connection to Coral Gables. We got my man D. Gully from the Seal on Bus. Glad you could join us. I'm already done started cracking these two heads right now. What's up, Gully? What's the weather in Buffalo tonight? What's the weather in Buffalo tonight? Uh, I'm 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 sure uh, I was really concerned about you guys after Sunday. Um, I looked at the uh, injury report for the Browns and I saw you guys' names. You right, you Double J, and Brother Rich. You guys were both listed as questionable. Um, <laughs> you know, you guys are all right. facts, facts. So uh, that's all I need to hear. So that's why yeah. my main concern. I'm glad you guys are all right. Yeah, them is facts. Them is facts. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Keep coming. We've got something for you tonight. Don't worry about what you got. Oh, you ain't got nothing. Oh, you're over there selling wolf tickets. I can't believe. Gully, do you know, can can I not have the music in the background, please? Nobody wants to hear Michael Jackson right now. Oh, that's Double J, apparently. Uh, <laughs> you made me... Uh, I- Apologize, I couldn't hear anything over the uh, the Sugar Hill Gang uh, with Apache playing it. <laughs> yeah, I bet you couldn't. You know, the Steelers, why we on the subject still, are one of the few teams, or the, excuse me, they are the team. Whenever whenever I'm having this debate about small market, they are the team I use as an example. They epitomize contrary to the small market. Not saying that the, con- the small market argument has no merit whatsoever but you know if you build it right it don't matter the era if it's built to last it's gonna last and they've been doing it for decades and <laughs> they seem to just no matter who whoever they put over there on that island they still get uh produce magnificent results gully the question was that's our, of course, our first game of the three games to watch this upcoming week seven in the NFL was the Steelers at the Titans. And I mentioned that the Steelers are 27th in total offense, 28th in passing, but they're five and zero. Oh. Give us your take on how in the fact that they're five and zero, oh, but yet and still 27th and 28th respectively in terms of offense. The two just don't seem to go together. That's uh, uh, the control of the game. Um, it's the way they control the game. You know, you don't look at the, uh, uh, you know, the impressive or the sexy numbers, you know what I mean, um, or yards per carry, touchdowns, points scored. Clearly, when you deal with with the Steelers, there's a way that they want to play the game, and they are, they've been imposing their will, uh, you know, five weeks straight. Now, I will say this, Brother Rich, I will, you know, I'm always a person that, that can learn, right? And you are right. Oh, because please. last week, I think the team that I went, I went, uh, I went so hard for and complimenting how impressive they were. It was the wrong team in the NFL. Um, the Tennessee Titans have continued th- through this season to basically legitimize why they were in a conference title game last year, um, wow. and they looked every bit the part. They are, I, I will say, if I if there was a team, if I had to do it again, which I'm not worried about, if I had to do it again, the Tennessee Titans would be the team I would tell you the guys to look out for because they look 
as they look as legit and for real as let's say I thought uh, the Bills are, even though you know, um, you know, I, I think they're too still late. a good team. Too late, too late, partner. Too late, right. partner. Mr. Buffalo right. played himself. Too late. No, 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 no. But they, but they are in fact for real. Now coming up this week, again, given all that I've said, I think the Steelers. Um, this is this is a big matchup for the Steelers because I think if the Steelers can control uh, and, and and limit the effectiveness of uh, Derrick Henry um, on, on the game on on Sunday coming up. Uh, I think the Steelers are going to are, are going to make make a lot of noise or basically make the statement that they are in fact the Steelers um, that we're used to seeing and they're a team to be reckoned with. They're a force to be reckoned with, and no, nothing's guaranteed. Not even down in, uh, in in Kansas City. Yeah, you know, and in the other half of that game, speaking of the Titans, do you know that the Titans right now on the season have 789 total rush yards? Their opponents combined have 685. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then we, do we want to mention to begrudgingly, I give credit to, once again, Brother Rich and Double Jason's ideology or thought process or philosophy wow. or whatever the wow. case. Oh, no, it's, but trust me. I, I, I give it up when I need to give it up, but it's, it's a rare occurrence. <laughs> okay? It's not rarely, if ever, is it really worthy of me giving it up. <clears throat> Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Mike Vrabel, he seems to be the one nugget off the Belichick tree that is just downright scary. To Gully's point, he's got the Titans looking like a legit, bona fide NFL powerhouse. And of, out of all the teams folks are giving, making mention of or making mention to or whatever the case may be about who will be in the AFC Championship or the Super Bowl from the AFC or whatnot, I don't think that they're getting enough credit. Brother Rich, do you think the Titans are getting enough credit? Absolutely not. Uh, Gully pointed out a minute ago, had he flexed his muscle as he did so eloquently, so fervently, Buffalo, the Bills, and they're terrible, terribly effective on what they're doing. Had he flexed his muscle like that for the Tennessee Titans, as he said earlier, we would have understood that because as Double J pointed out, they've proven their mettle having proven themselves last year, even though people doubted them, and they're back again showing we're still here. Uh, that was and Gully that mentioned that. Do, and you, that was Gully that said that. Oh, me, Gully. Yeah, can, you, can we, can uh, we, can hold, yes, can we, Gully, get, can we give Gully. credit to where credit is due? <laughs> you and Double J, yes, y'all so correct. used to Thank taking credit from people and not giving any, time. but Thank yeah, you okay. Real time. Yeah, Nevertheless, gotcha. but, but yeah. he, he, he repped Buffalo so hard, I, it's sometimes hard to remember. Oh, but wow. Can, but nevertheless. <laughs> okay, so he, got you. So he did say that. He, Gully did point that out to us, that in fact and indeed, this team has continued to prove itself this year. And there now you just pointed out to us uh, that, he, that, that there's a coaching tree involved here, that there is some credit. He finally gives credit to the fact that coaching does play some part. I said it was a combination of both. Now, that's what I'm saying. I don't waver, see? But y'all manufacture, you know, these figments of imaginations. You know what I'm saying? Imagination ain't the same as truth. I know that, the, that the, you know, ESPN will say different. But, again, that's why we don't, I don't do ESPN no more. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I always said it was a combination of both. I've said that from the beginning. I've said it then, now, and will continue to say yeah, Double J, <laughs> the Titans, are they a surprise to you? Are they legit? No, they're, they're very legit. Oh, uh, oh really? If really? you go back a few years and take a look at – Derrick Henry's been there for about five years, and he's been as consistent as it gets. Um, of course, I refer to him as Hungry Hungry Henry. Uh, he is yeah, the guy's a Mack truck with my pads on. keeper for that reason. So there is a little bit of a bromance there on oh, that end. So I, I am a little uh, partial on this oh, my subject. Gosh. However, the acquisition. So in other words, hold, so what you're saying is you. So what you're saying is what you're getting you ready to tell us you can't. Rewind the tape. No, no, we're not rewinding the tape. To a year ago. No, we're not rewinding the tape. 
what yeah. you're getting ready to tell us is that you because you're so biased and have a man crush or whatever it is, bro man, whatever you just call that, you what you're getting ready the following words are not will not be the truth. Is that what you're suggesting here? <laughs> oh, okay. That only applies oh. to uh, the cowboys, right, and the, barbershop J. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the, the lies. The cattle. Yeah, the lies. Go ahead, continue. On this program last year, I specified that the two reasons they would compete a year ago were as uh, due in large to Mike Vrabel and the acquisition of Ryan Tannehill. When Ryan Tannehill became the starting quarterback, everything changed, and they soared and, and of course, not only made the, the playoffs, but then – uh, even pushed the the now defending champion uh, to the brink. So in a very competitive game. Additionally, this team has suffered enormously from COVID-19 and had at one point in time, their first four on the depth chart at the receiver position, either out due to injury or COVID-19. Uh, and yet, as you look at their record, you would never know it. So with the consistency there, the fact that they're going to keep getting better week to week just simply by being healthier, that is a very, very dangerous team. Um, additionally, defensively, you talked about Pittsburgh's ability to mask and disguise and be somewhat complex, if you will. The opposite is happening when it comes to the defensive situation in Tennessee. It is actually very simple. Um, and again, the balance that they have on both sides of the ball is why they're where the, ultimately where they are. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be a classic matchup. This might be the best matchup so far this season. I know, you know, there have been a few others, of course, the folks have wanted to tune in to see. But I think as far as powerhouse and what the playoffs could look like early on in a regular season, we're going to get all that and then some for them, them, them Steelers and them Titans. But, you know, the thing that impresses me the most about Tannehill, the guy played wide receiver at Texas A&M, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, he played wide receiver at Texas A&M and got converted to a quarterback. Now, how how many guys can, can make that claim? They started out as a wide receiver, now they – uh, spearhead and, and the, the Titans offense even though I didn't put the right the numbers down the Titans offense is it's decent in terms of ranking where they rank at league wide in terms you know rushing and so on and so forth they average they they at or around about like 14th or 15th total so you know it, that's more than capable of getting to and going through the playoffs uh, you know on the way to a Super Bowl not guarantee making no guarantees and I'm just saying it's not impossible you know and in their defense is ranked right it's marginal too it's like 17th or something or another like that so we'll see you know <clears throat> but again to you all's credit double j brother rich you can see mike Vab- mike vrabel's imprint all over that team yeah and in our next game of the three games to watch we got the seahawks at the cardinals and we'll start with the seahawks and gully we'll start with you Similar to the Steelers, the Seahawks are 21st in total offense. But here's the killer part. They're 26th in total defense. And they, too, are undefeated. Is it all, Russ? Gully? What is the classic, what is the classic expression? There are lies. They are damn Dumb. lies. And, and then, then their expressions. Oh, statistics, so excuse me. Performance yes. on the, yeah, the, the performance game in and game out. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Just a team like that would be undefeated. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it, hold it. Here we are. Hold on, hold on, hold on. There are lies, there are darn lies, and then there are statistics. Where did that who where where did that come from? I do believe the I most hear that from our esteemed host. Uh, barbershop. Oh, <laughs> so oh, let me throw that to you since okay. we, we got guys here that are, yeah, we got guys here that are throwing them back our our miscues, if you will. Yeah, because I think I can throw a compliment or two. Yeah, and, back and, at us, and, but, uh, and the reason I digress. Yeah, no, no, and the reason why I asked you that gully 
is because our other two esteemed co-hosts, they're is so good. They're so good at throwing barbs. Now, and here's what's interesting. When we first opened the show up, both our other esteemed co-hosts do their little 20 second, 30 second monologue, if you want to call it that. Oh, after I introduce everybody, oh, yeah, man, we're so glad to be here, blah, 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 blah. And then once the show gets running, they go totally opposite of what they started out with, and then they get to throwing barbs. So I appreciate it every now and again, you know what I mean, just to get a compliment. You know, every now and again, I appreciate that. And did you did you use the word esteemed? Oh, wow, I appreciate that, you know what I mean? Because you'll never hear that from those two. Continue, Gully, my bad. Oh, no, well, I'm, I'm going to keep it brief. Uh, pretty much um, what they're doing uh, with Russ, Russell uh, Wilson is leading that team to do is is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, I think, though, you know, when you talk about these, uh, we talk about the, the offensive output or what have you, I think maybe in later, se- in later games in the season, when we get close to the playoff time, that may come back to haunt them. But I'm not worried about it. Uh, I'm not worried about it so much right now. As long as they're doing what they can do to win, and that's controlling the tempo, obviously, uh, I think they'll be all right against uh, Arizona. I expect no less than than the best we've seen of Russell Wilson and company. Um, let me not say it's just him, but uh, as if he's just leading a, a, a cast of no namers. But I like Seattle this week. Mm, interesting. Double J. What's up with the Seahawks? being marginal or at not at the or yeah I can't even say near the bottom but my gosh on the wrong side of in the 20s or if you want to say that being that it's only 32 teams I mean you being 21st and 26 respectively my goodness but yet and still again like the Steelers they 5 and 0 oh. you know are we are we ready to give Russ credit or or who we giving credit Marshawn Lynch or Pete Carroll well I will say this, that, again, it it comes down to to them. It is the offensive side of the ball. It is Russell Wilson. They're going to go as far as he'll take them. Uh, Defensively, they have, as you pointed out, quite a few questions. Didn't expect that. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm just hearing things I hadn't heard before on this P. Rogram, and I'm shocked right now and appalled, but I'm mostly shocked. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you, too. Are you still counting the hairs on the dog? Go ahead, Double J. Would you please finish your soliloquy? Sounded like Stephen A. Kellerman over here. Well, again, he's having a record-setting year. What? At some point, you, you may have to reevaluate if this is one of those circumstances where a high-octane offense is the result of the defense simply getting and, and giving the the other opponent rather more cracks or more at bats, if you will, to try to, to figure it out. And that's why uh, they've been marginalized statistically. But who's, whose offense is high octane? Well, the Seahawks, they, again, they, they've been. 21st in total offense, you call that high teams. octane? <laughs> they're 20 they have the ability to make the big play, Jay. Okay, well, that's not high octane. High octane is the St. Louis Rams with Kurt Warner, the greatest show on turf, or Peyton Manning, 2005, six. I want to say, when he threw for 48 touchdowns or 50 or whatever it was, when Dallas Clark and Marcus Pollard, uh, not Marcus Pollard, uh, what, is it Pollard? I can't remember his first name. Uh, Pollard, uh, Edron James. Uh, uh, Harrison and Reggie Wayne all had career years. That's high octane. Then, you know, unfortunately, when they ran into the Patriots, they couldn't score but three points. That's why everybody was on Peyton Manning. <laughs> about, wow, y- y'all blew the doors off the regular season offensively breaking records, and y'all can't get but three against Bill? What's going on with that? But, no, anyway, yeah, I, I, I don't see the – at 21 in total offense, that's not high octane. But they do make big plays because of DK Metcalf and Russ. Yeah, they do. They get down, baby, them Seahawks. You know what I mean? But then on the flip side, you know, who knows? Will it last? I just hope Russ can stay upright. I'd really like to see him get an MVP. Brother Rich, give me your thoughts, well, man. Well, I'll go How- with what you, you – you, I'll go with where you ended. It's about Russell Wilson in that 
he proved that a very good quarterback can keep a mediocre team in the contest in the NFL because he can make enough big plays, which is what Double J is pointing out, his big playability and the fact that he's such an effective quarterback. He has proven himself over and over again. But the fact is that Russell Wilson is the kind of player who goes about his work in a very nondescript way. He just goes to work, gets his job done, doesn't really play to the limelight, even though he's very popular in his own right, but he's not seeking the limelight. He's playing in a market, Seattle, which is not really on the radar. It's important, but it's not San Francisco. He's not playing in L.A. or New York or one of those kind of markets. He's just there in the Northwest doing his work, and he's very effective. And so from initially when we took notice of that team, most of us took notice of that team, we took notice of them for their defensive prowess. And while we noticed Russell Wilson, he was a younger version of himself. Now he's a mature, uh, developed version of himself with the coach that grew him into what he is. And we see that combination continues to keep them, even though they're a mediocre team, it continues to keep them in the contest. So, Russell Wilson. Yeah. Yes, I mean, and we do give credit. Both Double J and I have given credit to Russell Wilson. Oh, please. Check the tape oh, well. stop it. Yeah, I didn't check the tape. I threw it out. That was one of them tapes you had to throw out, you know, like them game films when you get – never mind. <laughs> I digress. Yeah. Oh, but then, too, it helps to have a DK Metcalf. And who's the other guy over there? Baldwin? No, not Baldwin. I forget the other little possession guy that they got that's real good. He's actually a deep threat, too. Real popular name, and I don't know why his name won't come to mind right now. But, yeah, it helps to have those kind of guys on there as well. They need to shore up that running game, too. On the, on the Cardinals side of things, what's interesting about the Cardinals – they are fourth in total offense. Can you believe that, Double J? The Cardinals? Well, Kyler Murray? No, I, this is no surprise to me. Uh, again, as someone who has Kyler Murray as his starting quarterback in fantasy. Oh, uh, well, go figure. In the same program uh, uh, a month ago that he was poised to make a substantial amount of growth year over year, and Back. with, again, the help and, and emergence of uh, of Hopkins coming from, you know, again, your favorite elementary, Deshaun Watson, Houston <laughs> Texans. Oh, so now, so now this is a knock on Deshaun there. Watson? Well. Oh, I, stop I, I it. As much a credit to. You just gave him DeAndre credit. Hopkins as well. I'm going to say this as well. Oh, you know, a lot of what's it. being done is, is Kyler Murray on the ground. They have not been efficient with Kenyon Drake. There's a lot of rumors that Chase Edmonds is going to be the long-term future. And remember, they gave up a lot, of, you know, not that long yeah, ago. Yeah, but Kenyon so Drake bought Drake. out the other day. Uh, that was part of this. Kenyon Drake bought out the other day. But, again, it, it, well, again, it, what, against the Cowboys? Yeah. I mean, you know, as long as you got two legs. You know, you well, but you give the whoa, 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 whoa. But we give, but you give the Browns <laughs> credit for beating the Cowboys or performing at a high hey, level against the Cowboys. The in there. Oh, stop it! it. The holes work, yeah. This, this is what I mean by this is what I mean by the gully. You see what I, you see what I'm talking about? You see what I'm saying? They give credit. I know. They I give know credit it. to when when it's convenient or the person that they like, brother Rich and Double J do. But if it's somebody they're on the fence about or somebody that's, nah, you know, not that important, it's like, oh, well, yeah. yeah. But this, but the premise is still right there. <clears throat> yeah, okay, I got you. Yeah, got you. So on one hand, DeAndre Hopkins is a Hall of Fame receiver type guy when Rich Fitzgerald or whatnot. But then on the flip side, well, you know, but uh, yeah, I'm not buying it. <laughs> I'm not buying what you're selling. This is Kane's country up here, baby. Hurricane North. <laughs> But I get what you're driving at, though. <laughs> I get what you're driving at. Kenyon Drake bought out, though. It ain't his fault or the Cardinals' fault who they put in front of him. The Cardinals didn't make the schedule. But they bought out. They bought out. They whipped them boys 38-10. to 10. Now, I'm not saying they're going to do that to the Seahawks, but again, the Seahawks' defense being uncharacteristic of the Legion of Boom, quote-unquote, we all remember, and the Cardinals' offense being fourth, Brother Rich, you don't give the Cardinals a chance on winning this game, maybe? Absolutely. What, 
Yeah, with Kyler Murray? Because. Oh, okay. I'm just I'm, checking. That's what I'm saying. With Kyler Murray, they absolutely are in it. Absolutely, they're in it. We, we were just, you asked us, initially, we started out discussing oh. their opponent. And so we gave their opponent their due. Oh. But we're saying absolutely, Kyler Murray and this team, they're absolutely in it. Uh, okay, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, Gully, the Cardinals are ranked fourth in the league right now in total offense. Do they stand a chance against the Seahawks? And it's in Arizona. By, by the way, has anybody has anybody on the panel been to Arizona? Well, Brother Richard, I'm sure you have. You know, when you was down there, you know, at the kennel looking for a new <laughs> little doggy. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they got a nice kennel down there. Uh huh. APL or whatever you call it. Yeah, Gully, I mean, what? Fourth in total offense? That's got to be lightweight impressive. Well, we, we, we've talked about it. I mean, the, the, each of our matchups today, uh, that we each of our previous matchups discussed, um, we talked about teams that are winning, undefeated, despite evidence to the contrary in terms of their offensive production. So what happens is you got to ultimately play the game. What do the Seattle Seahawks do that keep them undefeated despite having perhaps a pedestrian type of offense and a very forgiving, if you will, type defense? Um, it, it's got to be something about championship medals. It's got to be something about experience, uh, playing the game, uh, being in there. I don't, I don't think that with the Seahawks, uh, being ranked where they are, I don't think that that matters much how they produce, how much they produce, because, again, I believe it's about controlling the tempo, controlling the game flow. And uh, I don't expect them to do anything less than that, even going down to a division rival in Arizona. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not worried about it. I, I still like the Seahawks in that. Oh, it's all good. And in our third and final game of the three games to watch, we got the Bears at the Rams. I'll pick this one in particular because I'm kind of shocked. But then again, maybe I shouldn't be at the Bears and their success through six games with Nick Foles at the helm as opposed to Trubisky, a hometown kid, went to Mender here in Ohio, northeast Ohio. I feel kind of bad for the guy. But what is it about Nick Foles? Oh, and through those six games, let me say this. The Bears have scored 128 points and only allowed 116. Double J, what is going on with the Bears? Well, I think they're not only an enigma uh, in every sense of the word, but very much a microcosm of a lot of what we've discussed in our in, in the games uh, leading into this one, you're talking about a, a, a very balanced defense, an offense that clearly has weapons like Allen Robinson. Um, and arguably, as long as they have someone semi competent under center, they can make some things happen. But I, I definitely believe, and I think it's going to be echoed from everyone here that they are the most fraudulent team by record out of anyone in the national football league. Wait, repeat that. Say that again. They are the what? Their record does not actually reflect how talented they are. Oh, okay. Got you. Oh yeah. Well, I haven't, I haven't seen any of their games. Are you saying that? Wait, wait a minute. Uh, are you saying that in the negative? Yeah, meaning they should not be – that record should not be – it should be the opposite. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right. I'll, I'll wait my turn. Yeah, Gully, actually, I was coming to you next. Go ahead and have your say. You know, okay. you know him and Brother who's Rich good for that. Right huh? What would you say? The, who's, the, who's the starting quarterback for the uh, Bears right now? Nick Foles. Okay. Um, Nick Foles' entire career has been marked by being the guy who was there on a team that had already, um, let's say, there was all, uh, that was already outfitted for somebody else. So Nick Foles, unfortunately, gets the bad rap for being some, some for being dismissed as uh, as the the prototypical backup, backup quarterback. Mm-hmm. That is actually untru- you know, it's actually not not fair in this case because, simply put, when he was behind Alex Smith, 
it was the, I, I believe that was uh was that in Kansas City. Um, the decision for the starter was already made, and and Nick Foles just happened to be the guy to take the helm when something would happen to the to the quarterback that the franchise wanted. So he's not a backup in the sense of a journeyman in, in that in that he was never really good. He often had to play against. A, he often had to play and compete for a job against against another quarterback. Who was already supposed? Who was already chosen to lead the team? So when the guy who they wanted did well, even if Nick Foles did as well, the guy who they wanted got the job. I mean, if you prefer somebody, and the and and this competition doesn't do enough to eclipse them, you know what I mean? It's kind of like to beat the man, you got to beat the man. Um, that's been Nick Foles' entire career. That Super Bowl run was not a was not a fluke. It was it was more than Jeff Hostetler uh, leading the Giants to the Super Bowl in place of uh, injured Phil Simms. Nick Foles was capable of his entire career, and so what happens is when he'd have a mistake, when he didn't acclimate into a team and he'd stumble, they're so quick to dismiss him as a backup quarterback. Well, he never really was a backup quarterback. He just happened to have the unlucky position of being the guy who was also there at the same time as the chosen one was there. We see him leading a team that is five and one. I mean, I mean, hey, you know what I'm saying? Nobody expected this out of the Bears, uh, except for Spice Adams. Look him up if you know who he is. Um, but we can see, okay, with a capable, competent quarterback, this Bears team is as dangerous, huh? Sound like the Titans of last year as they should be. Um, I really don't think that they're a fluke. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it for who I think it might be a fluke, but um, I don't think that they are. I think it's legit. And um, I like to see them uh, win versus the Rams. You know, here's <clears throat> here's something else that I found interesting about Nick Foles. For a guy, when he's when he's a starter, it seems to not it doesn't bode well for him, to the best of my recollection. But as a backup, it's just interesting because some of his career highlights and awards are, of course, he was a Super Bowl champion, he was Super Bowl MVP. Made the Pro Bowl in 2013. NFL passer rating leader in 2013, which is an NFL record. Seven touchdown passes in a game. He's tied for that. I don't know who the other person is. 25 consecutive passing completions. He's tied for that as well. And his statistics, if you're into statistics solely, I feel for you. But if you use them in moderation, his completion percentage, I'm talking about from the time he came into the league up until now, okay, his current as a week five 2020 his completion percentage is 62 percent man so i know a lot of quarterbacks that would get a left arm and it might be the arm they throw the ball with to have a 62 percent completion percentage his touchdown to interception ratio is 76 touchdowns to 38 interceptions and then this passer rating thing that everybody else does 87.9 but here's another number. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but his total passing yards to date, 12,581. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, Double J, for Nick Foles? It's sure not Hall of Fame, right? Thing, but... No, no, but you know what? He, If we're going to suit his horn a little bit here, he also, to my understanding, is, is thir- in third place behind uh, Kyle Orton, and Drew Brees regarding uh, record versus Tom Brady. Oh, and imagine so, that. Kyle Orton and Drew know, Brees. Again, are they are they former Purdue players? Well, I, look, I, I Oh, wow. That up. Imagine uh, that. Just, you know, hey, some things fall into your lap. <laughs> oh, I bet Luckily they do. Opportunity means preparation. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah, continue. How how what a coincidence <laughs> that both Kyle Orton and Drew Brees, the two aforementioned uh, went to Purdue. Yeah. But continue. You were trashing, well, trashing he's, Nick he's Foles. He's a very efficient quarterback. Oh, he's efficient. He, he's very much the game manager that, that you're looking for. And, and truthfully that the bears need it. Uh, that's, that's why he was brought in specifically. If Trubisky did not improve. And, and as we saw, he was capable of rallying them against an atrocious Atlanta Falcons team, uh, at least with the, with the previous coaching that they, they were under. Um, taking it a step further, the real litmus test is going to be over these next three weeks. 
Because, again, you're talking about you're beating a, a Carolina Panthers team without Christian McCaffrey. Uh, you're, you're beating, again, like I said, the, the dirty birds who don't belong in the league. Um, you're, you're losing to the Indianapolis Colts. So we, we watched what, what the, the dog pound did to them. Um, you, you have to come back against the Lions. And then you're beating a, a horrible NFC East team in the, in the New York Giants. So really, why, you did what you were supposed to do, I guess. Uh, the only impressive win would have been against Tampa Bay that didn't look like Tampa Bay. Uh, certainly not the team we just seen the other day that, you know, took Rodgers behind the shed on RB. And <laughs> yeah, RB. Forward, though, This is what we want to see because this is going to be a very close game on Monday night. Yeah. Both teams are built very similar to one another and quarterback play is in my estimation, if I were to put pen to paper here right now, is going to be the difference. Yeah. But here's because neither team has an explosive run game. Uh, It's a running back by committee for the Rams. Uh, with the injury to Cohen, it's still it's now Montgomery and friends, and, or and Co. in Chicago as well, and so it's it, it's going to be very interesting to see with two gr- decent defenses, who can do what. Yeah, and speaking of the Rams, you're talking about opponent. Who's in front of you? Well, if we give him that weight, okay. Half of the Rams' schedule this season is against the AFC and NFC East. Given that who's in front of you, if we're given that weight again, what does that say about the Rams? Should they make the playoffs? And if they do, because they played more than half their games or half their games, excuse me, against the AFC and the NFC East, Would that be the main reason as to why they make the playoffs, Brother Rich? When I submit to you that anything involving the Rams is orchestrated by the NFL, specifically because of the investment of a $6 billion plus overrun stadium and the desire to have the Super Bowl, absolutely. And the desire to have the Super Bowl out in Los Angeles in a few years and the investment in that area in terms of the sports complex and the NFL's desire to have um, get this market back involved. So here's, here's what we're looking at. We're looking at a team that we're talking about two basic teams, just two pretty good football teams that they're going to have a, a, a pretty competitive game because neither one of them has a quarterback that will move the needle either way. They're both pretty serviceable quarterbacks, but neither one of them appears to have an it factor, even though they, 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 can, they appear to be able to win on any, quote-unquote, any given Sunday. After that, you're just looking at two franchises going at themselves, and they're both underperforming in so many ways that we could spend all night pointing them out. But with the Rams in particular, you have an overarching involvement and investment of the NFL who sets the schedule, and so you would ask the question, why would they set a schedule like that? Be- perhaps it's because they needed the Rams to be somewhat uh, um, uh, aggressive and progressive this year so that season ticket holders and marketers could focus on and support a stadium that is now designed to support two teams. Remember, they're trying to support two teams at one venue. The Rams and the Chargers are both going to be playing there. And the NFL, again, continues to focus on the Western envelop, uh, development and focus on this market out here and bringing it up. But I think that answers if we look very carefully at why the schedulers would schedule such a conference uh, uh, to play against them. Let's think about that. Yeah, interesting, interesting take. Gully, again, with the Rams schedule, half of it being against two divisions that are just downright disgraceful in 2020. What does that say about them, Sean McVay, et cetera, et cetera, going forward this year, maybe, I don't know, in terms of making the playoffs maybe? Uh, 
if you're beating the teams you're supposed to beat in the manner that you're supposed to beat them, then there's only so much that you can uh, take away from them having a soft schedule. If you're struggling against teams that you should beat, um, then that's a problem. But again, it's any given Sunday. So long as you play and beat the soft schedule for the softness that it is, when you arrive against competition, the expectation should be that you should be able to play up to your level of competition. Because clearly, you didn't let the downward, uh, the downward trajectory of your of your opposition affect you. So I would say, hey, as long as they continue to beat up the soft schedule, I would still hold them to a higher standard of being a competitive team. So I wouldn't be, I would not expect them to look frail versus a uh, versus another juggernaut in in the NFC versus a, a Tampa Bay team or a Seattle team or what have you. So, um, I, you know, I mean, you got to play the schedule that you have. Uh, you articulated very well just why, uh, Brother Rich, just why they have the schedule that they have. Um, it's hard to argue that. But, again, as long as you beat them the way you're supposed to, what can we, what can we really say? And, and the expectation is that you should be able to beat the tougher teams as well. Ah, oh, for sure, for sure. That was our three games to watch. Good stuff, fellas. Uh, here again, if you're up and around, you're out and about, and you want to give us a shout, the number to call is area code 267-687-0026. Once again, that number is area code 267-687-0026. And as always, we'd like to remind you the shot report is now being powered by none other than the fine folks over at Rocket Digital Media. It's the one-stop shop for all your digital marketing needs. You can look them up on Facebook at RDN Detroit, or you can go to their website, rocketdigital.net, and make sure you tell them the BSJ sent you. All right, fellas, in the second half or the latter portion of today's p program, we will discuss the rivalry recap, or should I say we will recap the rivalry that is only in namesake the Browns versus the Steelers. But before we get into that, I just like to mention for all my fight fans. Here come the I, low blows. Go ahead. I just go like ahead. to mention uh, to all my fight fans out there, in particular, all them fans that were fans of uh, Lomachenko, who argued me up and down for weeks, months, what felt like years about why he is, quote unquote, or was pound for pound best in boxing after only, what, 15 fights, one loss, one draw. Imagine that. Not a big enough body of work for me. I just want to say um, <clears throat> this Timo is for you. Shout out to my man TL Me Foe <laughs> putting him and shutting the door on Lomo. Nobody trying to hear that garbage. And Timo is calling everybody out. Now, I'm not down with him being so called undisputed. You know, we've had that conversation too when we had our boxing discussions about how many belts are out there. You know, they got Kellogg's Frosted Flake belts now. But apparently they're saying that he's undisputed because he got the four majors. You know, the WBO, WBC, WBA, and I think the IBF or whatnot. But the other ones, eh, they don't matter. And some people, because Loma lost, are going, well, he don't have all the belts. How can he be undisputed? Well, it don't matter. Pish posh. He whipped Loma's Scott. <laughs> but I digress. Now, take a rest. But in the second half, again, or the latter portion of today's P-Roll Graham, we are now going to discuss the Browns Steelers as usual beat down. <laughs> but I wanted to start <laughs> with Brother Rich. Of course, I know he has a mouthful to say and just throw this out there. What really happened? Go ahead. Go ahead. What really what really happened, Brother Rich? Cuz I'm I'm just saying, you know, it was it was all, you know, in the text messaging thread, you know, we had on the on the, you know, on the VSL the phone better, and whatnot. I, I you, you know, I was I was a rented mule. Simple, you know what I'm saying? No, no, no. I was a rented it's, mule. It's I need to be drug out by the woodshed no, 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 and beat was, over the, the head. Cowboys, but you, won't you know, all of that, that kind of talk. You won't, you won't bring that up. You won't, you won't allow you want a lot of time to deal with the Dallas Cowboys being beaten like a regular. That, that, because guess what? Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. No, no, no. Here's, Here's the issue. The, the issue is you all want to continuously talk about the Dallas Cowboys, and they're not in the rotation every week. I'm a sports talk analyst. My sports commentary is philosophical. I dig deep. I got to give everybody a turn. All right, it's real parody on this program. You to critique the Browns every week. You can I don't critique, critique the Browns, Browns every week. Every week. You, you are. And, and, hold and, it, hold and it. Your, your riding partner, your, your, and your riding He's a Buffalo partner, Bill. Stop it, stop is it. Over there, is over there. I know he's Buffalo Bill, but this week he was riding for the Bears, telling us about the Bears. I thought, I thought he was about to 
tell us about how the Mr. No, he was Dallas not. He the said the tight. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> oh, nevertheless, man. We're not talking about him right now. Okay, Mr. yeah. Buck. We're not talking about Mr. Buffalo yeah. Billy. We're talking about <laughs> you and the fact that you, every week, you critique the Browns, but you, you, you won't allow for us any, any allotment for the, the horrible job that is going on in Dallas right now. Well, whatever that fiasco you all got calling a football team. But okay. We're not even going to deal with that. Okay, now, so we're... We'll, no, but hold on. Oh, hold on. Yeah, hold on. No, 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 no. Gully, gully, gully. Hold on. Gully, gully, gully. Gully, hold it, hold it, hold it. No, no, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. The Cowboys are the division, are leading the division still at two and four. So two yeah, wins. That, but, that tells you, the, but that tells yeah. you, you, it only strengthens the argument you gave us earlier about the schedule for this team. It only strengthens the argument that double that that Jay brought gave us the subject matter to discuss. The fact that that's the setup that's ridiculous. Hold that on, the, your team is so bad that they're leading in a division that's terrible. Okay, but hold that on, that tells you how terrible the division is and okay. what's going on in terms of that that aspect of football. So you're right, you're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, okay, but, but y'all find a way to critique. But, but m- meanwhile, at the same time, admitting that the Browns play in probably one of the toughest divisions. That, that we, we we can imagine right now. Come yeah, now. but nobody let's, let's listen. Credit where credit no, is due. Yeah. So let's go back to what happened this week. What happened this week is the team faced a team that was far superior from them in every category on the football team, and they made them understand and made us understand we have a lot of work to do. Go back to the drawing board, and I want to say this for all the listeners, for all the listeners who are listening, you can pull the tape on this. Our coach, who I know is a and is a very erudite, very learned, very scholarly uh, a sports analyst told me. Told you know what? Hold on. You know what that sound like? That You know what that sound like? Gully, you know what that sound like? You know what that sound like? No, you know what that sound like? No, I'm interrupting you. Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm interrupting you. Yeah, I am. You know what that sound like? Gully, do you know what that sound like? I don't mean no disrespect, but go ahead, continue. I don't know who you I was born that night, not last <laughs> night. That's what that sound like. I don't mean no disrespect when people come with that. I don't mean no disrespect, then, but, you know, you got your listen, shoes on backwards. I remember you told us, you told us that Baker Mayfield would be good for our team. And I, I had, did. I was skeptical. No, okay. I, I, no, no, I no, 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 no. Your right. recollection is terrible. Right. And that's two R's with a U in front of the both R's, I-B-L-E. And let me tell you but what I said. Never that. Yeah, no, I ain't no nevertheless. Let me tell you, no, no, I ain't no nevertheless. nevertheless. You're not getting out of this that easy. You're not getting out of this that easy. What I said was I believed in John Dorsey because John Dorsey, let's be real since we're being realist here, okay, since we're not making stuff up, you know, like, like the Lucky Charms, green clovers, yellow moons, bright stars, or whatever that is. Dorsey had a track record better than anybody who had come through the doors in that front office and had that position since 1999 of putting teams together that made sense. Is that true or false? Because we deal with absolute truths on this program. We don't deal with possibles, maybes, and okay then. So if you look at what he put together in Kansas City, why wouldn't you think that he would be able to not maybe necessarily duplicate, but replicate or some similarities or some semblance to something? So when he picked my man Baker, I was like, okay, I'm on record. And I promise you, I'm going to find that tape because I am on record for saying I was not expecting that. I wanted Josh Allen, to be honest with you, because I liked how Josh Allen played at Wyoming in the cold weather, because that is a barometer to a quarterback in Cleveland having some success. You have got to be able to throw the ball with some zip and some accuracy in this weather, because when the Browns are in their heyday going to playoffs and AFC championships, back to back to back to back to back, they played at Municipal Stadium. And anybody that went to Municipal Stadium would tell you, you think First Energy, First Energy is a yacht Compared to what compared to what municipal used to be in terms of how the winds Whoa. would swirl in December and January, you had to be able to throw the ball. That's why I like Josh Allen. But I said, okay, if Dorsey making the decision, then who am I to go against it? That's what I said. That's why I was riding with him. Oh, and by the way, I think they're getting ready to get rid of him. I honestly do. I think they're getting ready to find a way to manufacture something to come out being said. Like Cleveland media is so good. Not all of them. But a majority of them, and I point to the fact or to a case where 
when Kellen Winslow was on the team. And this is before all of the stuff that he's dealing with now, whatever. Yeah, he a cane, but I'm going to tell the truth about it. It's, it's jacked up what he's going through now. He got to deal with that. But while he was here with, with the Browns, um, when Kellen Winslow was here, it was, who could I say? Oh, man, I can't think. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But the point is, when the Browns were going through the AFC championships and winning and so on and so forth, you had to be able to throw the ball in cold weather. Oh, and then to my Kellen Winslow point, thank you for senility kicking back in. Here's what happens. He was considered a malcontent in the locker room because he wanted to win. I'm not saying he went about it the right way, but he wanted to win, and he expressed that every time out. When I used to go to the camps down there, it was said that he would come in the locker room, Kellen Winslow, and Browns players would be sitting around playing pool and playing cards, and he'd be like, man, we just lost to the Steelers again, 51 to nothing. And y'all ain't, y'all, he said, man, y'all some. So they's like, oh, he coming in here disrupting our locker room, which somebody needed to light a fire under y'all. So they made up this story. And they used the Cleveland media, which is why I'm not going to mention no names, why I keep telling y'all over and over again, why it's three certain ones in particular that I do not like and will never like. They came up with this story about Winslow, said he had an STD. And they spread it. Yeah, said he had an STD. Now, keep in mind, I know somebody that works at Cleveland Clinic at the time, especially. That's all I'm going to say. He came out, Winslow did, I don't know if it was a week after or two or whatever, and he said, oh, he held a press conference almost. He's like, oh, I'm about to set the record straight. Because the question was, why was he always, why was he in, at the hospital? It seemed like he was in the hospital every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. Now, at the time, the man was married. In this town, all it takes is for it to get in the paper. And it spreads like wildfire. And they be mostly lies. Yeah, I said it. They be mostly lies. Said the man had an STD. But that was all a concoction because they wanted to get rid of him anyway. And when he came out and said, y'all want to know why I've been coming up in the hospital and why all these other Browns players been coming up in the hospital, that the reports really ain't being reported like they should? He said because of the staph infection. You remember when the staph infections were real big? And guys, were, I remember that. Yeah, Absolutely. staff infection. Right. And Joe Jurevich has won a case, if I'm not mistaken, against the Browns because of his staff infection. Okay? And that's really what set it off that Winslow wasn't lying from the beginning. You know what I'm saying? Because Joe Jurevich's staff infection case didn't come out until after Winslow's demise was already a done deal. So they do that here. And, you know, that that's the they do that here. You know what I mean? So, again, <clears throat> at the end of the day, they're going to probably get rid of Baker. And they're going to come up with it. They're going to, I said all that to say, they're going to concoct a story that will place all of the blame at his feet when it's supposed to be a combination of. So, yeah, Double J. I'm going to disagree with you there. You're going to disagree with me on what part? I I believe first it's going to be, well, on on the part of who will be footing the blame. Um, Because, again, his, his, lack of production if you want to view it that way um, in, in my estimation wouldn't be entirely an accurate portrayal of, of him or even his behavior while he's been here in comparison to while he was a member of the Giants uh, so I, I truthfully believe that this is it's easier for the, that same media you're referring to in their history to place the blame on the franchise itself in their mismanagement and not being capable of having a true quote unquote superstar. Yeah, well, guess I what? That's going you got to live. Go you got to live here. There. You got to live here. You got to live here for a few years. They'll mention that. They'll throw that well, out there. It, look, it, again, but it will be casual. Up north here, that we had the fiasco with with Nate Burleson and the Happy's Pizza. There's a free plug. Um, and so, you know, you got guys that, uh, you know, they, they came up with songs on, on the local radio that, you know, folks that are running 
the the media or the figureheads uh, here up north uh, aren't even from the north, and so you know there's no bias there, and it's very easy for them to uh, to just you know get the viewership up by by honing in on the negative and and again as I've stated time and time again that's why you keep getting the the, the same negative results because again the change is not always good and as I've stated on more than one uh, attempt here in this program, the consistency side of things, especially in the National Football League, is what's yielding the best return. Uh, again, look how, how desperate, and for years, uh, Cincinnati was, was attempting to get rid of Marvin Lewis, and look where they are. They're stellar dwellers. Yeah, I'm... Look at the Houston Texans, again, you know, for, look at the, you know, again, it doesn't always work. It, it fails more times than it than it actually is successful uh, a lot of that has to do with the general public not understanding the business side of things where again you look at uh, a houston texans example right now and i don't i, I don't want to bury them too much here i know i have some linkedin colleagues uh or contacts rather uh, so i definitely still want to leave that door open um but nevertheless they have you know a they, when you allow that Stan Van Gundy type of uh, both, you know, general manager as well as head coach concept, that can lead to a lot of bad business deals. And whoever inherits that team now, currently it's Romeo Cornell, but you're you're stuck financially within that same cap number, regardless of whose name was there signing, putting pen to paper. And so it is not as easy. I believe the only person going to be moved during this trade deadline is going to be David and Joku because I'm not quite, and I'm hope, hopefully the, it, this is echoed throughout the rest of the fan base. There's no reason to hit the panic button. You, you sell an asset like that because you found consistency with folks like Hooper and you have a, a decent rookie behind him. And then you address the immediate need which is either safety or linebacker. I don't care, but either way, you're going to get a decent upgrade from it within that. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll return well, I'm, for someone from like that tight end. Yeah. Well, if you, if you, if you go to do that and you get rid of Njoku, what you need to do is you need to package him and Zendejo and you need to get a safety. And you, I worry about linebacker later to be honest with you. But let me tell you what the narrative is already being established or already being set when it comes to Baker Mayfield. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Y'all, you, you, got, you, got to, you got to come here and live for a couple of years to really get the full effect of how this media is when it comes to the Browns and when they don't, don't produce, how they always snap the panic button. They're asking the question already, is there a chance Baker Mayfield gets benched for good and is replaced by Case Keenum? I'm telling you what they're going to do. They're going to talk about the team as a whole in terms of blame, quote unquote, but they're going to focus that blame on Baker. Now, you and Brother Rich have mentioned more times than not on this program about coaching, which it seems like whatever topic we discuss, that always shows itself. So, again, if we're going to say coaching, then those who are already drawn this driving this narrative to get rid of the guy, Baker Mayfield, that is, they fail to or willingly dismiss or ignore the fact that the guy has had 42 different coordinators and this being only his third season. Isn't it the teacher? It's not on Baker in terms of being a willing participant in terms of wanting to learn the guy did everything. I think Brother Richard said that. Didn't you say that at the beginning of the NFL season about how this dude worked in the offseason? All those things are true. So he satisfied my position on terms of the player has to want it because he showed more often than not this season, if no other season since he's been in the league this short period of time, that he wanted it. He put the work in. I can't ask for no more than that from the player. He put the work in. Can, 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 so let me let me intervene here on that thought. It's the coaching. Why, with the record that they have, Jay, is this even being discussed? Because it's I keep trying to tell y'all because it's Cleveland. It's Cleveland. 
This is what they do. They start, they plant the seeds. I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you. And not all of them. I'm not, I'm not trying to just say no broad stroke here with, with a brush. But I'm telling you now, they good at planting them seeds of doubt. Look, let's go back to this point. What was it? The, it wasn't even, the season hadn't even started yet. It hadn't even started yet. And already the question was being asked, who should call the plays? Did I not send you and Brother Rich the text in that article saying, see, here we go. Why is that even a question? Why are you yep, even stirring right. that up? So now Richard Stefanski has to answer 12 hours worth of questions about who going to call the plays when he could have spent them 12 hours helping Baker get ready or for game. See, this is what I'm trying to tell you. And then immediately be like, well, he's that guy's garbage. I don't know what happened because y'all always starting stuff. Now, the dude didn't play well. And it could be that he is what he is. I don't know. That interception he threw to Minka off the rip, that was bad. That was a bad read and so on and so forth. But what I like to take into account, see, I do more than watch the ball. Now, if he ain't it, he ain't it. But And this is not necessarily in his defense. What I'm saying is for those people who are having all this conversation after the fact, let's consider all of the evidence. See, too often a whole cake is made off when people want to make a whole pie out of one slice. You can't do that. They want to pick apart Well, he didn't see this guy and he didn't see that guy. No, he didn't. But the folks that was watching that, I asked him, did you see his offensive line breaking down immediately? Was the guy not running for his life? As much as I get on him, I'm I'm here to tell the truth. Was the guy not running for his life on every play? Right. Did the guy have time? Yes, that was two bad throws. That one in particular when he just he That's what it. you're talking about trading. That's what they need to upgrade. They need to give them some time. That's exactly what I was thinking. Well, but, but That's the, the kind of stuff they need to, if they're going to upgrade, they need to upgrade that. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, Teller did not play. And he's a big part of the, the Browns. What the Browns need to do, they need to get some nasty in them. That's what I'm saying, man. I've been watching this Brown Steelers for too long. I remember when Turkey Jones dumped Terry Bradshaw on his dome. If you go back and watch the Buffalo Bills Browns playoff game, it was something similar to it when Felix Wright upended Don Beebe and he came right down on the crown of his head. That's what Turkey Jones did to Bradshaw. And I don't even remember what the score was in that game, but Turkey Jones, we used to call him Turkey Jones, he sent a message to the Steelers. When it comes to the Browns and Steelers, man, I've seen this too. I've seen this for far too long. Throw out the X's and O's. Throw out the touchdown ratios, and throw all of that. You need to go look when Cam when Hayward came out and said, "Oh, we gonna make him feel us." Oh yeah, guess hey coach, throw the playbook in the trash. We about to go get that. Excuse my French. Or sort of like what Russ Grimm said to Joe Gibbs. When the the Washington football team is what we'll call them at that time when Joe Theismann was the quarterback and they was playing the Dallas Cowboys, a heated rivalry, especially back then in the NFC championship. And what was the linebacker for the Cowboys that was such a problem? Randy White. Russ Grimm could not stand Randy White. Joe Kibbs caught caught a pass play to, to Clark or Monk. Theisman came in the huddle, and whatever the play call was, it was a pass play. Russ Grimm was like, what? He was like, oh, he said, man, he looked over the sidelines and told Joe Gibbs. Russ Grimm did now. He said, we're not calling 52 gut. Joe Gibbs was waving his arm. I'm telling you, this is all true. Joe Gibbs was waving. I'm like, wait, whoa, what you, what you doing? I call, he said, no, no, I got to send that dude a message. He told Joe Theisman, 52 gut. That's a running play, you know. <laughs> He said, we call 52 gut on the game-winning drive all the way down the field, and Randy White was gassed. Russ Grimm manhandled him. He said, Coach, I just had to show him. Forget calling that bootleg and trap and off 69 power toss trap and all that. Forget calling all of that. He said, we running it straight at him because he got the most mouth. Anytime the Browns play the Steelers, man, that's what it's got to be about, man. 
I don't care who, I don't care how many catches Odell did have or didn't have. I don't care how many times Landry this, that, then this. When it comes to playing the Steelers and the Ravens, you just gotta, you gotta, hey, you just gotta let them know your hands is tired from holding your tongue. I'm about to lay these hands on you, boy, because that's what they do to us every time they beat us. That's what it looked like to me. That's why I say complexion. And I didn't mean to take the last portion of the show over here, but that's what it looks like to me. Every time we play them, whenever they blow us out, man, they be laughing and joking and hee-hawing. You heard what James Harrison said before the game. Y'all ready for some fun? Y'all for the clown show or whatever he called it. Man, I'm taking that personal. And that's what the Browns, that's why the Browns look like they do against them more times often than not. They got to take it personal. They got to take it personal. I mean, I missed Oh, I wish Chubb had played in that game. <laughs> I wish Chubb had played in that game. Because he sent he doles out punishment. Meanwhile, everybody else is getting punished. And I don't want to hear nothing about Odell. He took his shoes off and all that. Stop. No, I'm not saying you all saying that. But I that ain't got nothing to do with nothing. The guy wants to win. Why is it that the dudes who want to win is always labeled as the bad guys? Anyway, I digress. But yeah. Yeah, to your point and to Brother Rich's point. Well, yeah. I want to say this, Jay. They, they have $38.6 million in cap space. Who do? The Browns? The Browns. They are, Double J, if you look at the Browns, Meaning they, they that, always have the most money, though. They've had, they've had more cap space for the last six, seven, eight, nine years than anybody. And for the last two or three years, I think the other only other team may have been the Colts and somebody else. But, but the, go look at the Browns when it comes to cap space. Go look at the Browns' cap space compared to everybody else in the NFL for at least five years, at least. They always got the most money. Well, part, but that's that's kind of the the. They don't know how to spend that it. I'm painting here is that. Well, no, it's it's that they're they're not uh, being reckless by any means. And they've invested, uh, it looks like, about $35 million in anyone that plays on, an, on the offensive line. Um, with that being said, to your point about Baker's stats in, in time specifically, obviously it's worked from a, a rushing standpoint. Um, you know, only very few players have, have been able to be successful with, with no, uh, no offensive line, if you will, for example, Barry Sanders. Um, but he shouldn't have played in that game. He shouldn't have played in that game. His ribs were that jacked up. And after he, after the Steelers hit him a couple of times, any human being in that game, is going to be thinking about climbing the pocket and them di- and them and, th- and it's the Pittsburgh Steelers flying at you. He shouldn't have played in the game. Period. Case Keenum should have been in. Or let Jarvis Landry well, do let's, it. Let's, so let, let's focus on that point. Let's let's focus on that point given what you stated about the media. About his perception within that same media about uh, you know uh, regarding his play if case keenum goes in and let's say it was a it was a different yields a different result than what we've seen either by way of a very close game or let's say they they walk away with a win who's your starting quarterback to follow it you mean had the browns won had the browns won that game is that what you're asking Let's say Baker Mayfield never set foot on the, on the field. Again, his stats are not overwhelming by any means, and you know the media has, has spoken about that time and time again, which is why his his job is yeah. called into question. Yeah, but the but the but the going thing in the NFL and from my understanding that had yielded. Mm-hmm. But the going thing in the NFL from my understanding is you don't lose your job to injury. Not permanently. You're not supposed to. Uh, Tyrod Taylor. Yeah, well, we just watched that happen. Tyrod Taylor, Justin Herbert. Yeah, but guess what I mean, though? But Tyrod Taylor's been in the league for nine or ten years. Tyrod Taylor, in his fifth year, no disrespect to him because I like the guy, but in his fifth year, you could see he wasn't going to be no more than what he was. You can right, see you that. Don't, you, 
it, that's that. Okay, so t- generally, I, I could easily see how you could make that case. But at the same time, here, uh, he was that's his first year with the Chargers. But let me tell you something. And so, when Tyrod Taylor and, and missed no, Hollywood no Higgins, camp. I mean, when he missed Callaway on that deep ball against the Jets. And the Browns had only had like 14 total yards offense or whatever it is. Tyrod is serviceable, but he not he not no he not no number one man. He not no number one. The well, Chargers again, had him at number had, one. You're talking about had he not gotten his lung punctured by a team doctor, he arguably would still be the starting quarterback. Maybe now they would say, "Let's see what Her- uh, Herbert can do," because they likely wouldn't have won any of the games, but. Again, at least for the, the first six weeks of the season, he would have been under the helm for, for the Chargers. Yes, he would have. But I'm telling you, because he would, he would have been under the helm, uh, but it was really only in namesake. Tyrod Taylor is not a starter. He's been given starter opportunities, but far before he ever got to the Chargers, Tyrod Taylor was just a serviceable guy. And I like him. I like him. But he don't have he don't have no wild factor. The guy been in the league, what, what this is his tenth year now, eleventh year. Come on, man, he, Tyrod Taylor. Yeah, but if you but going back to what you asked me about, had the Browns won that game with Keenum, had Baker been sat out? Is that what you're asking me? Who would I have started the following week? I'm start- not, not just you. But who the, the knowing the local media would have been all over it because again likely his passer rating, but Baker's flirted right around in in as a career he's at about eighty six point seven. So if if you recall who Gully and yourself were very high on earlier in the same program, that's very similar to Nick Foles. Yeah, but I would have. So I would have. St- those circumstances, they're not overwhelming numbers, but in wind, he's efficient, and he's not. But he's not lighting up the charts like you would think he was. And I and I believe that's even the media's point. Is you have Landry and Beckham, and you you're throwing for 156 yards against a, an atrocious defense with the Washington Redskins. Let me listen. Or, or I'm sorry, Washington <clears throat> Football Team. But here's why. Once again. And unfortunately, by the way, Gully just let notify me. He had to drop out. He had some other things to take care of. Gully, appreciate you joining us for the little bit of time that you're on here. But going back to what you said, let me let me the, the thing is why are you calling pass plays with those two guys? Look at the routes that Beckham and Landry are running. Go look at the routes. He doesn't have time. For those kind of routes. And what's ugly to me, they the same kind of routes that Hugh Jackson was running, that Freddie Kitchens was running, and that every other dude that didn't came through these doors seems to want to do. They want to reinvent the wheel. How many times have I said, and I will continue to say, the Browns' biggest loss to date is Kyle Shanahan. Kyle Shanahan, like all of the other guys who get credit for being great offensive coordinators or head coaches that had a quarterback connected to the hip with them, you know the one commonality amongst the Bill Washes and the Bill Parcelleses and the Bill Belichicks and the Vince Lombardis and all of that kind of stuff with Bart Stars and the Bradys and all of that, you know the, what the one commonality is? Let me tell you what Bill Walsh said when he drafted Montana. Yeah, I had an offensive system in place. But when I went and watched him at Notre Dame, I threw my offensive system in the trash. And knew from Mm. that day, not only were we going to draft him, but we were going to build an offense to him. Explain to me why we've got a different name or the Browns have a different name since I can't claim them no more. But the Browns have a different person with the name plate on the door. And yet we still see some of the same head scratching type stuff. Listen, I'll say it again and I'll keep saying 
You don't have to have John Elway to win a Super Bowl. You can win with a Trent Dilfer. You can win with a Jeff Hostetler. You can win with a Brad Johnson. Now, it don't hurt having an Elway, obviously. It don't help having a Favre or Aaron Rodgers. But even still, the both of those two don't have, <laughs> or should I say combined, have what Bart Starr by himself has, RB. They say Baker got trouble throwing over the middle. Okay, well, yeah. I'm telling you what they're getting ready to do. They're getting ready to try to get him out of here. I don't know if it's going to be by the trade deadline, but the, the, the ball is already rolling. So this is why I'd be so – Well, I, I will say this. If there's a team that, that's going to inquire, because I, to my understanding his contract is uh, from at least a, a league – perspective it's it's relatively uh any rookie deal for a quarterback is is very uh cap friendly well obviously um, additionally so you you could make a case that dallas would based on the, the play of, of dalton could very well uh man why would you send him there make the phone call why would you send him there seriously well, what do you, you've told us about all of those great targets. And, again, they're, they're yeah, they the are. first place in their division <clears throat> right now, that daunted NFC. Okay, but listen, but what it, <clears throat> excuse me, wasn't it Brother Richard that said 38 minutes ago now about the top, them down from the top, mm. and then down from there? Jerry Jones wants to be the end-all, be-all with the Dallas Cowboys. I don't care who's quarterback in that team. It will definitely implode by season's end because of him. He's at the top. He puts people below him in those positions of authority. But we all know they got joysticks in their back. Jason Garrett had a joystick in his back. Come on, man. Jerry Jones is what the reason why the Cowboys ain't what the Cowboys, everybody still want them to be. <laughs> Jerry Jones is the reason why. Come on, man. He cut his nose off despite his face every trip. Oh, y'all ain't nearly, oh, ain't nobody. I ain't paying this. I ain't paying. Man, come on, man. Come on, man. That locker room. Only thing about the Dallas Cowboys, the Cowboys currently, that's the Dallas Cowboys, is the star on the side of that helmet. And you can see from the game yesterday <laughs> that them stars are lightweight starting to peel. Let me tell you something else that this, that's being said about Baker. <clears throat> and this is what I think is condescending. You give credit and then discredit all in the same f- expression or phrase. By far. A better Browns team indeed this is, but one that still, and they emphasize, still doesn't look capable of competing with the top-tier talent in the AFC North. Excuse me, they were saying, but it was about Baker, then he made this comment about the Browns. And they said, the kind of talent you'll find on the Steelers and Ravens. See, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. It's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Hey, if the dude do go well, somebody on this program there's, there's just said more that. Conversation, there's, there's more conversation being said right now about bringing in Matt Ryan from the Falcons. Oh, my God. Than there is about bringing no. in a safety or, uh, or a linebacker. No, no, to no, me, no, 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 no. This is, do this that. is everything that. that is wrong with, with the franchise by allowing outside pressure to dictate how you operate. Hey, guess what? Ask any Browns fan. Yeah. I, Double J, I want you to come to the shop. I want you to come to the shop, and I want you to ask the Browns fans in the shop. I want you to ask Twin, Dre, Scott, and all them guys about that, that last part you said, about letting outside noise dictate. That's the way they operate and have done so since 99. This is the part I keep trying to tell you all about. They succumb, the, the Browns management does, to, to, um, to fan pressure. Let me for all of the disdain that that guy gets. People making caricatures about urinating on his grave, Art Modell and whatnot. When, man, he did not listen. And when Belichick was here, man, they drove a hard line in the sand. Man, they wasn't thinking about the fan. Man, we let us worry about this. <laughs> let us worry about this. Lindy and Fonny and them guys. Well, and the results were coming when Bill was there. Those results were what? 
It, the results were speaking for themselves with Belichick there. Yeah, but before Belichick, what, even uh, with Schottenheimer. Again, that, that turnaround happened really even, quickly. Even with Schottenheimer, though, before, before Belichick, with Schottenheimer, Lindy Infani, Sam Ritigliano in 1980 with Brian Seip when he won NFL MVP. They didn't succumb to that. They didn't give in to the – man, they didn't go with all of that fan. They didn't buy – they didn't go off into that. But what have I said for the longest to you in particular, Brother Rich, about the Browns? They don't do well when they're in the driver's seat or when it's stars here. You got to get guys like – who who knew who Webster Slaughter was before Webster Slaughter played with the Browns? I mean, I did, but I'm just saying. You know what I'm saying? Or Reggie Langhorn or Brian Brennan. Well, Brian Brennan was nice at Boston College. But I'm just saying. Bernie was somewhat of a star at Miami because he had won the national championship. But guess how they got him? In the supplemental draft. The Browns had a few pieces and parts. Ozzie Dusen was a star. You know, the few, you know, but guys who went, they were stars, but they were not, you know, braggadocious and all, you know, they can. But they don't do, they need guys, they need no name guys to become something. That's when they're at their best. And of course, too, when they have a uh, two tandem in the backfield, I mentioned that as well. They just don't do well out front, man. It's unfortunate. But watch. He, I hope he do go somewhere else and ball out. I do. Matt Ryan. Now, did you hear what you just said? Because I've seen that as well. Matt Ryan, you're discussing, you're talking about bringing Matt Ryan in here, but you need safeties and linebackers? Bad. This ain't that case of the Ravens where you draft a want versus a need, and you know that conversation we had. No, you need you, Zendejo has got to go. <laughs> he got to go. Oh my gosh, where's Eric Turner? Rest his soul when you need him. I'm telling you, that's what else they're saying about the Browns, man. I'm telling you, this is what they do in this town. This is what they do. They want their cake. They want to eat it too. They want to make it. They want to bake it. They want to shake it. They want to take it. Oh my goodness, can you do one thing at a time and make up my mind? Ain't no dog going to win the world, man. The guy don't have no time. He's running for his life uh, on just about every play. But I, and, I, I, again, I don't disagree with with the lackluster offensive line. Again, I, I keep honing in on the fact that they have cap space. There's a, a trade imminent regarding, you know, the, the, the tight end um, that should, you know, yield a, a decent haul in return. Uh, pulling the plug on, on the quarterback, in my estimation, would would be detrimental to your three year plan, which is truly to compete for something. Ah, yeah. Uh, Who are you telling? To, to start a system over with with somebody else at at the quarterback position of all places is the you know you you put it all on red or you put it all on black at that point because if it doesn't work. And, and you knew what you had beforehand, that you are going to be paying for that for a very, very long time. Okay, but Double J, and let me... so, look, again... Mm-hmm. Let, me, let me say this to you right quick. You keep mentioning, you keep saying cap space. You're right. That's a fact. They do have cap space. But let me throw this out there at you. The Browns got cap space. They got money. If the guy in charge of the money... It's George Steinbrenner. Then you can sit back, fold your arms behind your head, and have your cold one. You can relax. But if the guy in charge of the money is Tyrone Biggums, well, then how important is having this so much cap space then? <laughs> you get what I'm driving at here? <laughs> Mike Holmgren came yeah, but, in. I mean, again, I, I, would, I would say you're absolutely right with that. Very uh, extreme comparison in in years and, and certainly in decades past. I just haven't seen that over the last five years. I, I've seen moves that money wise made sense, trades that also made sense financially, allowing you mean maybe last two years these voids to be filled. You mean maybe no 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 you don't don't please don't go five right years now. back don't go five years back because you talking about Ray Farmer. Really? Two well, years. Again, you've got to let old contracts expire. And, again, with that being said, that was what was being done at the tail end of that past regime. They were in a, 
basically their hands were tied. There was nothing they could do, and they weren't going to get any results. So the only thing you could really do is just simply put a product on the field that was going to get you a, a great draft pick. Uh, now, this you mean Trent Richardson? Very different to be able to have. You mean Trent Richardson? That was the great draft pick that they have. Trent Richardson was the great draft pick. Who? Trent Richardson. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, oh. Because <clears throat> no. they had cap well, space no, then, too. Remember, they at least were intelligent enough to get rid of him, and, and what they got for him was, was a lot. Yeah, but listen, once again, I need you to go back through the Browns' player acquisition slash draft history. When you say five years, go back five years. Yes, I get it. One guy going out still got leftovers that the new guy got to deal with coming in. I get all of that. But we're talking about guys who come in here with a fresh slate. They get rid of the people that is not theirs, and then they start over. The Browns have been 60, 50, 60, 70 million, whatever, on the cap space, and these guys still go out and buy molded bread. Whatever they got back for Trent Richardson, they got them dudes ain't even on the roster no more. Barcavius Mingo. Come on now. Oh, and let's not – how long ago did they draft Justin so, Gilbert? Let, let me ask you, if you remember – you remember in May they released the linebacker, right? Which was a uh, – that, that was a stupid move. Yeah. And, again, that was a, a – Denard, a, Denard specific Avery. Financial. Yeah, Denard Avery, who they, Denard Avery who's, is who they let go. No, no, no. I'm talking about Kirksey. Oh, well. I mean, <clears throat> I would have kept Kirksey over Joe Sherbert if that's where you're going. Me personally. But, you know, there's a lot of people that love Joe Sherbert. I, not, I didn't dislike him, but uh, I don't know. When they got rid of Avery, Avery was – Denard Avery was that guy that was – they got rid of Kirksey and Schobert. I I'm not gonna fight you on that. But Avery, oh yeah, knuckle up. You don't get rid of that guy, and you need that kind of guy right now. And he was, if I'm not mistaken, and I didn't know he was his name was gonna come up in this, but I wish I had looked it up. If I'm not mistaken, Avery wasn't no top round pick. He wasn't like no. He was probably maybe a fourth or fifth round pick or something wacky like that. When you talk about monies against the cap or whatever the case may be, I mean, I don't know it in depth like you do, but when you talk about monies, if I had to, if, it, if I was looking at the monies, if I'm the Browns in that situation, who I'm going to keep, Avery is not the guy I'm going to got rid of. Now, I could be off a, time, a, a cent or two, but Avery, Avery is not the guy I would have got rid of. They got rid of him with the quickness, and they could have kept him. This boneheaded, man. And that, a guy like him, yeah, yeah. They need to get rid of Olivier Vernon, a cane, absolutely. They need to get rid of Njoku, a cane, absolutely. Absolutely. One can't catch, and the other one seemed like he didn't caught a cold. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just trying to tell you. Avery would have looked real good in that brown. Well, and, again, he's asked for that as well. He, he, you know, so, again, this is now national news that he's, he's asked to leave. Uh, and he did this, I want to say, late last year, too, or at some point last season as well. So this isn't, you know, breaking news, so to speak. But I, I believe both, both are uh, in, primed for, for a departure. But, again, I, I, I truly believe the – what they get for that move is what you really want to pay attention to. Because if it's on the defensive side of the ball, then you understand they're trying to win today and tomorrow. If it even flirts with the quarterback position or any other skill position offensively and not a, not a lineman, again, I said skill position. then, you know, at, at that point, you, you put them in the shark's tank because they're, it, it would be the same old song and dance. But 
This wow. is where truly I hope that they have turned the page as a franchise. Do not succumb to the outside pressure. You have absolutely no well, reason Good luck to. with that. Again, the expectations this year were not there. Yeah, Mike well, good luck with that, year. not succumbing to the outside pressure. Good luck with that. Yeah. And yeah. I believe they can – Still, they absolutely can be a playoff team. Well, yeah, but this, here's the deal. Um, here's the deal, though. And you, you have you have the lowly Bengals up next to, to make all things right. You get a, a quality Raiders team who is actually quite the opposite. They've invested, to my understanding, they are the first in the in in the NFL in terms of uh, amount spent on an offensive line. Who the Raiders? So that's that that's that's John Gruden, absolutely in the in the Raiders. Yeah, and the Matt, Texans, of course, they're we that, that's your guy. You know, he very well. You you, I would not be opposed. Would you be opposed to them making the call for Deshaun Watson? Uh, yes, I would. And I'm not at liberty liberty. Well, but to, wait a minute, I'm not at liberty to say right now on this P program why, brother Richard understands why. But on this program for today's episode, I will not go into details as to why. But no. Because sometimes there have been on more than one occasion where Cleveland is the place where, as some former NFL players have said in regards to the quarterback position, it's where careers come to die. I'm not saying that that's the case now. I mean, give it credit now. Stefanski and them, you know, they didn't put up four wins and so on and so forth. But when I see the play calling, I'm telling you right now, Alex Van Pelt needs to be calling the darn plays. He's not. He's not. Steph- I'm saying, uh, but I'm going to say this. This is why, you know, and again, they may still come to that conclusion. This is why there's absolutely no reason from a scheduling concept over the next five games, they will play teams with a combined record of. Seven and twenty-three. Oh well, like Gully said, you beat the teams you're supposed to beat, and I think the Browns are good enough to beat the teams they're supposed to beat this season, if no other season. But back Again, to Njoku, right yeah. quick. Njoku, yeah, a one-four and one with the Bengals. Yeah, at that point, you're five and two. Let's go ahead and say that the Raiders get the best of them. No, five no, five you don't concede. No, 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 you don't concede victory or defeat or whatever you have. You want to put that? No, I would I say the Raiders going to get them. No, 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 no. Mm-mm. I don't do that. When it comes to my Canes, I don't do that. We're going to get the win. Even if we take the L, we didn't, we didn't lose. We just ran out of time. But as far as Njoku is concerned, you're not going to get nothing for him. He cannot catch. If I'm not mistaken, the I, one, I disagree. I disagree. They're not going, man. They, if you look at what they're, you could make, you could send them to Washington right now. Okay, but listen, 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 listen. Hold on, hold it. You know, or, or get no, Ryan Kerrigan. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. Ryan Kerrigan is a defensive lineman anyway, by the way. Well, I think he, in a system, he, do, he might play some stand up. He might stand up a little bit. But let me ask you this. Let's say you're a GM of another team and the Browns are shopping in Joku. You put the tape in and watch. All the games he's played in as a pro. Are you going to give up one a Ryan Kerrigan for him? What are you? Why are you giving up Ryan Kerrigan for him? Based on what? When your when your current option is Logan Thomas, absolutely you would. Because again, he's a veteran. You're not. But you're not. He's thirty two years old. Man, but the, but Washington he, again by trade, he can play on the D line. You're absolutely right. Again, uh, being a, a going to Purdue at one point in time with him. Um, I got to see him play, line up with your hands down and hands on the Yeah, top. exactly. So he's, he's been a left outside linebacker as well as a defensive end. And I'm sorry, Brother Rich, to cut you out of this, but, but by all means, if you feel like you know, need to jump in, we got about five or six, seven minutes left before we no, get out I'm, of here. No, I'm, trust me, I'm, I'm enjoying and I'm being enlightened. Y'all good. Okay, but again, Double J, let me ask you this question. Logan Thomas is your tight end, right, for, the, for Washington? That's correct. I promise you, he can. He, but he's a better receiver. If and that probably ain't saying much than Njoku. We are bringing Njoku. You, what does Njoku do 
Now, remember, now, let me say it again. This is a former Miami Hurricane. Now, I stand up for my Canes when they're on the right side of things. But if, if it's, but I'm telling you now, he can't catch. And then Washington got issues with they, at their quarterback position. So how, how are you helping yourself you, there? But here, you're, you're helping by giving another offensive weapon right now. And especially when if it comes he can't to a catch the down type of offense. If you put the tape in of Njoku in a Jay, Browns uniform. Jay, I, I've heard that. From, the Lions said that about Eric Ebron. We're not talking and about Eric Ebron. Right but we're not talking about Eric Ebron. I'm talking about David Njoku. I'm not going off of what ifs. If you, I'm saying, put the tape in of in David Njoku. Or go back and watch games with David Njoku in them. And you tell me how... He's a, you said offensive weapon. In the same sentence as David and Joku, he wasn't even an offensive weapon when he was at Miami. Offensive weapon? In the same sentence as David and Joku? Are you serious? Unbelievable. Did I not say, and this is to hey, all my Kane Nation he out there? 1,100 yards as a receiving tight end. Oh, well, on Madden? Much of which came out. One season. Oh, Madden. Six foot four tight end. Okay, like so a basketball player. Okay, so I like take power forward. Oh, in. please! Now you now you trying to make him out to be Antonio Gates? Not happening. So I tell you what, since he had eleven hundred yards, because I that I didn't know, and I'm gonna have to go back and look that up for myself. Find, tell me where he's at when it comes to NFL drops. Yeah. Yeah, and I and, and listen. Well, he, wait a minute. Did, didn't uh, didn't Zeke didn't Zeke have a few drops this weekend? He dropped eight Zeke, of didn't, He dropped. And eight. didn't Zeke have like three drops this weekend? Yeah, Zeke, Zeke probably fumbled a thought. Zeke probably Zeke fumbled. Was a, dropped in more newspapers. Zeke yeah, Zeke. Was yeah, more Zeke probably. A little kid delivering the newspaper. Yeah, he did. But we're talking about David and Joku. I I put it like this. I guarantee you, you cannot trust his hands. You're not trusting his hands. You're not trusting his hands. I mean, go go put the. T- I'm I'm saying, all the the numbers look that that looks all all fine and dandy, fine. But if you, I'm put the tape in. That's what I'm saying. Put the tape in. For him to be such the weapon, his numbers. Sh- f- f- how he been in the league for how long now? Four years. Three at least. I think this is his fourth year. His numbers should be off the charts. Offensive weapon. Oh, not happening. I'm gonna put a we're gonna put a poll up <laughs> on the face on the fan page. That's what we're gonna do. Is David joke the off the, the words offensive and weapon do not belong in the same sentence with David and Joku. They don't now he built like one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he built like an action figure. Ah. But when every time I see a ball going his way, I'm nervous. Man, bring back Gerald Ice Cube McNeil or Eric Metcalf. Yeah. And listen, anybody that will give – we giving up – you said – you know what, I'm, I'm going to go back to this one right quick with you. Ryan Kerrigan, David Njoku. Which of the two, regardless of position, is far more proven – I'm asking a question. That's not rhetorical. Well, again, I'm going to, I'm going to lean to, of course I'm going to lean to, to Kerrigan, but the point is you have to, it, it, this is where the business perspective side of things comes into play. Well, you if know you what? A upgrade, a capable. Receiver, yeah. And you, and you're right. I forgot. We was talking uh, about the Washington. We was, I was talking about, I forgot. We was talking about the Washington football team. You're right. They would do something like that. But I promise you, the teams who who really whose who organizations really are flour, who, who organizations flourish, they the Steelers or the or the, the Patriots or the Chiefs or somebody like that. Man, they're not giving up nobody good for David and Joku. <laughs> they're not doing it. <laughs> no, well, that's not what you're expecting at this point in the season. What you're looking for is someone who's looking to shed cap space. And boy, if that doesn't scream Washington who's ran like the New York Knicks, then, I, you know, maybe otherwise 
the New York Jets. <laughs> but I, based on how that defense is played, I don't think you want anyone coming from there. Okay, well now, okay. And so that's the you point. Who, the Brown, you saying who, the Browns? You saying the Browns? few suitors. You saying the Browns wouldn't want anybody from there coming from there? From the New York Jets on the defensive side of the ball? Oh, yeah, absolutely not. No, the only guy that they would have won, he already gone, Jamal Adams. Yeah, he's already gone. I don't look. I man, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're gonna do. But I'm 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 on the record as a lifelong, not lifelong, but long enough Miami Hurricanes fan. If the Browns get rid of Njoku and get a Kerrigan or a up, I mean, an upgrade on defense, kudos to them because whoever they get the guy from, they fleeced them. Yeah, sort of like Mike Dicker. Giving up, um, how many draft picks did he give up? 412 for Ricky Williams. And that ain't no knock against Ricky Williams because I like Ricky. But come on, man. You talking about business decision? That wasn't a good one. So, in, in other words, there have been teams, NFL teams, that make bad business decisions. And the only way I see that happening. Hello, Brian. Yeah, oh, well, that's, again, that goes without saying. But I can I can see Washington doing that because they got a history too for making bad business decisions. Yeah, they do that. My bad. Excuse me, I forgot who we was talking about. And then one last thing before we get out of here. Who were the Browns named after? Do either one of you know who the Browns were named after? Or or let me no oh, no, no no yeah yeah I was get, let me let me do it this way. What do you all think the typical answer is when? People are asked who were the Browns named after. Uh, I wouldn't know. Certainly, so I, Paul Brown. Yeah, brother, Rich, you said that's why I re-asked, brother. Rich. You you think Paul Brown, right? Brother Rich, absolutely. Double J, you say Paul Brown, absolutely. Well, it, I mean, otherwise, what would you say, Joe Lewis? I don't, I don't know. Wow, contrary to popular belief. The Browns were not named for their famous coach, Paul Brown. Rather, they were called initially, 1946 officially for the Browns, but when they were, or 45, I believe, they were called the Brown Bombers after the nickname of the revered boxer of that era, 1945. Yep, Joe Lewis. Imagine that. That's a good one. Okay. Imagine that. Go Browns. And and Paul Brown himself said during that time when people were like, just name him after the Browns. He's like, no, I don't I don't feel like I'm worthy enough to be a team named after me. So, you know, eventually people the association people didn't stop with the association with Paul Brown. So he just let it be. You get what I'm trying to say? And the team just said, Okay, whatever. You, you know. Okay. Yeah, you know, if y'all want to say it was because of Paul Brown, and then after a while again, Paul Brown was like, Well, well whatever. If y'all want to say it was after, named after me, so be it. Y'all can have that. But initially he was like, No, don't make that connection. Give it up to Joe Lewis. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's what we do here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Fellas, it's always good stuff. And on that note, it's been fun, but we got to run. We appreciate y'all for listening. Don't forget to check us out right here on Spreaker.com. Or you can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, and now iHeartRadio. Or, of course, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and give us a follow. Also, we ask that you don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or you can hop on over to the shop's Facebook fan page. Leave a message. Uh, you know, or a comment or two, it don't matter. And if that don't work, Google it for my dudes or my mans, Bro Rich, Double J, and D Gully, and all those who follow and support us, we say thank you. Oh, and as always, check out my man and my folks over at Rocket Digital Media. It's the one-stop shop for all your digital marketing needs. I'm Barbershop J, and you've been listening to The Shop Report. And remember, the next time y'all want to know what's really going on, man, come to the shop. Walk-ins are always welcome. Holla!